homemade traditional Peruvian dessert, alfajores, basket of ham, beef, turkey, veggie gourmet sandwiches. Call Giveaways Catering, phone number 778-245-3007. Welcome to the Immigrant Magazine's program, episode 160. For our guest, the most difficult challenge as an immigrant has been working on her career. She's a biologist, and she said on her profile that she considered Vancouver as a competitive city. On this interview, we talk about what uh, does she feel as an immigrant so far? Why did she choose Canada to live? And is she a competitive person? Cecilia Valencia Sandoval from Guadalajara, Mexico is our guest on our Telasha Story segment. I came to Canada to study uh, back in Mexico before coming to Canada. I was working for the Mexican government in conservation in natural protected areas. So I decided I needed uh, to do a master's, a degree to to have more tools to, to get better at my career. So I decided to come to University of British Columbia because it was a really good university to, to study what I needed uh, to get better. Well, I came to Vancouver a few times before starting and I really fell in love with the city. It was a, a city that since the first time I arrived, I said, I can definitely live here. And there is a few places in the world where I could live, and Vancouver was one of them. So I got really lucky when I was like doing my research on which universities were the best for the program I wanted to do, and Vancouver was one of them, so it was great. So then it was easy. I was like, well, Vancouver is a beautiful city, and it's one of the best universities on my career, so why not to migrate there? So. Well, yeah, the f um, it's hard for me to be away from the family, especially in when there's problems on, I've been through, when I'm in rough times, I need that support from my family. And it's a way, uh, so that's hard. And also now that I have a baby, it's, it's hard not to share with my family my baby, right? We are just Skyping and interacting with my family via Skype and that's hard. Although I have to say, like, I travel to Mexico two or three times a year, so that helps. But anyways, it's, it's hard, like, and it's, my husband is not from Vancouver either, so we don't have his family here. So we're kind of alone. And then I find in Vancouver, in general, in Canada, people migrate all over the place. So the friends I made at school in university, they all are gone. They went to Ottawa to get better jobs, they went to France, or they went back to Latin America. So it's hard to make like long-term relationships here because people just keep moving around all the time. So that's, that's been a challenge. Well, I, I feel proud of myself. It took many years to get to the point where I am. I never felt like there was like uh, any discrimination or racism like in my experience. But I do find that Vancouver, it's a very competitive city. Like a lot of people, not only from Canada, but from all the world want to live in Vancouver because it has such a like good quality of life. Like the lifestyle in Vancouver is really nice. So a lot of people want to migrate here. So that makes it very hard to get a good job. So you need to adapt your professional goals into these like competitive uh, city, right? I do feel I'm competitive, but again, like as this is such an, uh, a competitive city, it's, you're constantly competing and getting better and better and trying to, to study, study more or like find ways to, to apply your career. That, that's been a challenge for me, for sure. Like in Mexico, I think I could like find a more suited job for my career. 
So it was hard for me to adapt to Canada, to Vancouver in particular, because, uh, yeah, there was a lot of people like me in here. A lot of people study what I did, have more experience. So what I did instead, it's, I kind of like re rethought what I could do with my career here. So that's why I started to create my own projects. I started like a, with my husband, uh, environmental planning consultant firm. So he manages the Canada project, projects and I manage the Mexican projects. And then I started like an importing company. I bring products from Mexico that are socially and environmentally responsible. So, I mean, these things have taken a long time to come together, like after many years of frustration of not finding the right fit for my, like the right job, for sure. Professional wise, that's what, yeah, it's been more, more difficult to me to adjust my dreams, my passion into Vancouver for sure. But after 11 years, it's, it's been good. And it's been a huge learning experience. Since I was a kid, I was exposed to English. I used to travel and spend like a few time in the US here and there. So I think, yeah, like, you know, like in Mexico, like English, it's basically the second language like we are exposed to movies, uh, music and all that. So, but it's not the same when you actually like move into a country where it's only English. So yeah, it was a challenge, especially going to university, right? Because it wasn't just like knowing how to ask uh, what do you want to eat in a restaurant or how to, if you can use the bathroom or it was like more about like technical stuff. So that was a challenge. It took a few months to adapt to the technical stuff. But I mean, of course, as you mentioned, my husband, it's, uh, it's Canadian, so we speak English, so that helps, I practice. So my advice will be, before migrating, try to, you know, like read and watch movies only in English and just get, you know, like get to practice in your country before migrating, because if you arrive all of the sudden, like, it's overwhelming, right? So that would be advice, just to study and practice as much as you can before migrating. Basically, one of the reasons I fell in love with Vancouver is because of the clean air, clean water, parks, urban uh, transport, and just like Vancouver per se. I would say Metro Vancouver, it's a chaos, but the city of Vancouver itself, it's a really sustainable city in a way. So I really like that. So I, I appreciate that. That's why we live in, in, in the core of Vancouver. We live on Main Street and we love it. We just like all the amenities that are around. You can walk all over. We don't need a car. Uh, now with a baby, it's amazing. We have community centers that, are, that have access to everyone which is not the case in my country. You have to have a lot of money in order to go to a private club or a private amenity, right? Do you have kids at home? Have you noticed that your son or daughter uh, move constantly, their hands or feet? Or have you noticed that they don't put enough attention at any activity, what they have to do? Is your kid hyperactive? Yolanda Montoya has the answer in our mental health segment. ¿Qué tal amigos? Nuevamente aquí en la revista El Inmigrante en su sección Salud Mental, Yolanda Montoya. El día de hoy eh, quiero tratar un tema de muchos de ustedes conocido y muy inquietante especialmente para los padres que es eh, sab cómo saber si nuestros hijos tienen o padecen el trastorno por déficit de atención e hiperactividad. Eh, bueno, el trastorno por déficit de atención e hiperactividad es algo que se conoce así eh, a, a voces, eh, pero en realidad no sabemos eh, cómo determinar si nuestros hijos lo padecen o no lo padecen. En la actualidad, eh, 
muchos de, de los maestros en los colegios suelen eh, como diagnosticar, por así decirlo, o determinar que alguno de nuestros hijos tiene eh, este trastorno o padece este trastorno simplemente porque es un niño muy inquieto. Eh, quien determina básicamente esto es eh, un manual que es el Manual Diagnóstico de Trastornos Mentales que, en el que se basa la Asociación Psiquiátrica Americana y la Organización Mundial de la Salud. Este, este manual eh, se revisa periódicamente, en la actualidad está el, se le conoce como el DSM-5 y bueno, ahí eh, tiene claramente descritos cuáles son las características que se padecen en este trastorno. Otra característica que suele tenerse también es cuando el pequeño le cuesta trabajo eh, mantener su atención eh, durante largos periodos de tiempo, como puede ser la lectura, que se aburre fácilmente, que se inquieta fácilmente. En el caso de los eh, adolescentes y de los adultos, eh, generalmente eh, no prestan mucha atención a cuando están en juntas o cuando están en, en lugares eh, en donde requieren de estar quietos y con mucha atención, se, se inquietan fácilmente y no logran, eh, se levantan al baño, en fin. Otra de las características que suelen tener estos pequeños eh, y que se detectan fácilmente es el que no cumplen con sus tareas, eh, el que además eh, pierden fácilmente los útiles escolares, libros que son importantes, eh, sus lápices los pierden constantemente. En el caso de los adolescentes ellos evitan eh, el realizar eh, tareas, eh, eh, revisar artículos largos. En el caso de los adultos, pierden las llaves, pierden los lentes, pierden documentos importantes o retrasan hacer tareas, informes. Esto es, es algo que, eh, como que muy, muy determinante eh, que se puede notar fácilmente en los adultos. Eh, otra característica que suelen tener eh, estas, estos pequeños eh, es que... Eh, no se les dificulta organizar tareas simples como el poner sus útiles escolares en orden, el arreglar su cuarto, el llevar a cabo alguna actividad que se les pide en casa, no logran hacerlo. Eh, curiosamente, la hiperactividad está caracterizada eh, porque los niños, especialmente los niños, suelen estar muy inquietos en, en la mesa de, de trabajo, eh, eh, mueven sus pies constantemente, sus manos están retorciendo to todo el tiempo, no pueden estar quietos. Es como si tuvieran un motor interno que los impulsa a estar siempre en movimiento. También es característico que ellos, eh, los niños con hiperactividad específicamente, o impulsividad, eh, hagan cosas eh, que normalmente un niño eh, no hace, es decir, que se mueven constantemente poniendo a veces su vida en riesgo, hacer cosas, de, de trepar en, en lugares a los que saben de entrada que está prohibido o que pueden correr riesgo, pueden lastimarse, eh, no pueden mantenerse quietos en ningún momento aún cuando se espera que ellos estén sentados a la hora de clase, por ejemplo, se paran sin permiso, eh, se levantan, interrumpen la clase, suelen eh, hablar demasiado, eh, interrumpen a la maestra, contestan las preguntas antes de que se les termine de hacer las preguntas. Entonces, bueno, ¿cómo vamos a solucionar esto? Es importante mencionar que no necesariamente el trastorno de atención viene acompañado con la hiperactividad. A veces se da simplemente un trastorno de atención sin la hiperactividad, pero muchas veces también está acompañado con la hiperactividad. Eh, generalmente esto se maneja con una serie de, de terapias psicopedagógicas. Eh, a veces eh, a lo que funciona es el biofeedback, es una terapia interesante a probar. Eh, en muchas ocasiones también es importante mencionar que eh, eh, se, el tratamiento se acompaña, el tratamiento psicopedagógico se acompaña con el uso de medicamento. Sin embargo, para poder determinar de una manera eh, eh, real y fehaciente si el, el chiquito padece o no eh, esta enfermedad, hay que tomar en cuenta la edad porque esto generalmente suele aparecer antes de los 12 años o alrededor de los 12 años. Eh, hay que hacerle y aplicarle pruebas psicométricas que hay personas especializadas para ello y eh, obviamente requiere de tener el diagnóstico eh, de un neurólogo y es precisamente el neurólogo quien va a determinar 
si estas criaturas requieren o no requieren el medicamento. El uso de medicamento a veces es necesario, pero en general eh, es importante evitarlo, porque lo que en realidad sucede es que este trastorno nunca desaparece, el niño simplemente tendrá que aprender a manejarse, a saber que tiene ese trastorno, a saber cómo va a poder manejarse para organizarse, para detener su impulsividad y poder pensar antes de actuar. Si este trastorno no es atendido a tiempo, los niños suelen tener problemas ya de adolescentes, suelen meterse en problemas graves precisamente por su impulsividad. Como realizan actividades sin pensar, eh, se meten, suelen meterse en problemas, problemas de drogas, problemas de robos, eh, porque no piensan las consecuencias. Las madres y los padres son los que sufren mucho con esta, este tipo de niños que no tienen eh, un eh, espacio para poder eh, expresarse eh, con esta impulsividad tan abierta, pero bueno, finalmente los padres también tendrán que entender y aprender a tratar este tipo de niños que son realmente difíciles, pero saber y aceptar que existe una solución para ello. Esto es todo por el día de hoy, amigos. Espero haberles dado alguna información interesante y nos vemos en el siguiente programa. Que estén muy bien. I was wondering what kind of benefits we can get if we paint. And one of them is uh, the drawing and painting stimulate both sides, the right and left brain hemispheres, helping to increase your memory. Painting with Miralda segment. Next. Hi. Welcome to Painting with Miralda segment. We have been making drawings, but this time we're going to do some uh, painting with acrylics, with color. Um, we are going to use um, contrast, which Doug is going to explain to us what is contrast. And we are also going to see about uh, complementary colors. In this case, I use these colors and, of course, the contrast. Hi, I'm Doug. I'm here to talk about contrast. This is a gray. Let's take a look at what happens to this gray when we put it beside two of the most extreme versions of contrast between a white and a black. You put the gray beside white, it starts to look darker. When we put the gray beside a black, it looks lighter. And that is one of the things about contrast. There is a guide that's available to painters at any store. It's, uh, it's cheap. It's called a color wheel. And it looks like this. Sometimes it looks like this. And what the color wheel does is it graphs the relationship between all of the basic colors that are available to the painter. Yellow, yellow-green, green, blue-green, green, blue, uh, violet, reds, oranges. These colors are all listed inside of this wheel. If we pick one color, let's take a look, for example, at our original green and we draw a line straight across the wheel to find out what the opposing or the opposite or the complementary color is we find that it's a red we can apply this technique determining the relationship between colors to any color we might pick one thing we need to know when we want to paint contrast so we can have this effect and colors and the relationship between colors. In this case, is complementaries. We have here uh, uh, violet and yellow, and green and blue. Okay, so let's start with the basic, which is uh, the background. We want to paint here a uh, dark background. Blue are green. And blue. Mm -hmm. 
We're mixing the colors in wet. And also I can see the color in the background. So I can see my green, I can see my red, and also the color transformation. Well, I let this to dry, and then we got this color, which I like very much, uh, because, you know, it's kind of brownish and sort of black, but it's not uh, uh, black or brown. It's a unique color that you get when you mix these colors in a surface. And also you get these gradients here, like uh, you can see the color, uh, you know, below, and uh, the transparencies. This is something that we really can do with acrylics. I like it very much. So we have our, our background, and now we're gonna paint uh, flowers, and they are going to be in a less scale in the value, which is going to be not this saturated, just to, in order to pursue the contrast. So let's try some Bensi yellow, which is very much light yellow. And uh, we're gonna try to paint three flowers. One, two, and three. We are going to try to avoid the middle. We're gonna try to put the, the, the flowers a little bit in this range which is our third range. I will explain this in another segment. Never worry about your painting. The colors are gonna start giving you. What you're looking for. Then we paint another one here. Now that it's dry, we are going to uh, paint another layer. Why I love uh, acrylics? Because of the transparency. You see this transparency here? We're gonna try to keep it. At the same time, we're gonna give a little bit more light. And uh, don't get too concerned about the shapes. I'll tell you later why. Get concerned about enjoying what you are doing, being happy. Be serious. It makes you feel happy. Okay, let's just try it like this. Let's cross the lines. And this one. Okay. I will add a little bit more yellow in the flowers. just to add a little bit more light. You see how they, they play with the transparencies, how they interact, the layers. If I go a little bit beyond the edge, they look like if I were, if they were moving, right? Just play, play with it. Okay, if you don't like it at the end, do again your background, dark background, and it starts all over. Easy. And now, what did we do on this episode? 
behind the scenes. Next. Well, conserve. Well, I guess you. Can we start again? Okay, yeah. Is that okay? Sorry. <laughs> Y los cuadros que más se venden aquí en Vancouver son los que tienen hasta 100 layers. Sí. Before closing this episode, I want to show you my drawings because I feel stimulated with our painting with Miralda segment. And this is my director. This is me. And this is our marketing staff. And finally, you, my audience. Hmm? I feel good because if you learn something new every day, you feel excellent. Thanks for watching us. Problemas de relaciones interpersonales, separación, divorcio, problemas con niños, adolescentes y adultos. Soy la doctora Yolanda Montoya, soy clinical counselor y mi teléfono es el 604-861-1071.